Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Green Tech Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Green Tech Today, the Twit Network's Top 25 Green Tech Innovators series. This episode of Green Tech Today is brought to you by the Eco Imagination Challenge from GE. GE and its partners are awarding $200 million to ideas that help build the next generation power grid for the 21st century. For more information and to view and comment on ideas, go to ecomagination.com forward slash challenge. Good morning, everybody. I am here for Green Tech Today. I'm Dr. Kiki. And today, rather than being on site, I'm on Skype. And I'm talking with Dr. Will Roach. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Calera, a corporation that is working on carbon sequestration at coal plants, at, at, at natural gas coal facilities um, through the creation of cement and, and other products that can be that can be used by the public for green building supplies. Welcome and thank you for joining me, Dr. Roach. Good morning, Kiki. How are you? I'm doing fantastically. Now to get started, tell me the basics. Where did the idea for Calera come from? Um, well, Calera is about three years old. And I think the, uh, the idea um, is millions of years old. Uh, and really, it, it steps out of some, uh, some biomimicry. And, uh, and, and the founder really had a really pretty elegant, intellectually elegant idea of um, sequestering CO2 uh, and creating carbonates. And this, this process is akin to the formation of coral reefs. So uh, uh, Brent Constant's vision was taking CO2 out of waste streams and using an aqueous process uh, and making uh, solid carbonates and therefore trapping CO2, but also making beneficial products. So the whole idea, as you can imagine, has scalability and it's very intellectually attractive in that you make products rather than spending money just to sequester CO2 uh, in ways that don't create any value for the, uh, for the uh, end user. Has this, has this, it, this sounds like a fabulous idea, using nature's own technology, basically, to, to get rid of something that's a, a problem compound, carbon dioxide. Um, have you run into many problems in the, in the chemical aspects or the engineering aspects of getting this, getting this started? Yeah, I, I think that um, the, the key is CO2 is a huge problem. And... Um, Sorry, just lost you there. My screen likes to turn off. Um, so CO2 in itself is, is, is a, a big challenge. So, so the way the process works is that you, 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 you put the flue gas through an absorber, which is basically a, a aqueous solution, water-based solution with the base high pH materials. And you really, all you're doing is using the basic chemistry of acid plus base equals uh, salt plus water. Mm -hmm. And you're precipitating salts, carbonates. And you're very finely controlling the chemistry by using alkalinity. And the original idea was about reusing natural alkalinity or waste alkalinity. So the inputs would be essentially free. I think that as we've gone through the three years of evolution, we found that that's not as, uh, there's not as many of them as around. And also you have to pay a little bit of money to get a hold of them and you can go other ways and we spend a lot of time looking at electrochemistry making the base to trap the CO2. So there's a whole bunch of very clever chemistry associated with doing this. It's unfortunately not as simple as just having a container bubbling through the, uh, the gases from the exhaust and out pops cement. So there's a lot of very detailed chemistry, particle engineering, and very, very clever guys. The company, um, just to give you a sense of that, I think is about 120 people right now. And I think there's around 30 of those people who have second degrees or PhDs. So it's a high 
intellect effort, uh, high technology effort, doing a pretty, mimicking a pretty fundamental process. That's, that's essentially what it is. Now, limestone is something that is used to, to uh, create cement, and the mining of limestone and the processing of that limestone is very uh, intensive. It's a, it's a high producer of carbon dioxide. It's not great for the environment, lots of uh, nasty byproducts. Um, can you tell me how what you're doing with Calera um, can, is, is, is kind of helping to fix that problem? Yeah, well, that's the long-term objective, or one of the long-term objectives. Uh, so, so if I had a hierarchy of what's the company all about, mm -hmm. I think the first one is we're a company that sequesters CO2. And so uh, the second one is, and we're trying to make usable products. And cement is one of those usable products. And the beauty about if we form, if we are able to make cement at scale, it's a massive scale of the solution to the CO2 problem because you can sequester a lot of CO2. So that's the vision. Cement is one of a number of different products we're thinking about. So, so let's just talk about cement a little bit. So the whole idea here is you form uh, uh, calcium carbonate, which is then reactive um, later on when you, uh, after you've dried it and you add water back to it to make a cementitious product. That's what we're doing. And, um, and you know, there's a whole bunch of engineering work around the way in which you precipitate it, the size of it, and the actual morphology of that uh, uh, calcium carbonate into a reactive form. So that's the plan. And so it's, uh, it, it's, it's blessed with an elegant and understandable idea. And it's challenged by a lot of very difficult chemistry and conditions around forming that cement. Um, yeah. And, and just, just on cement, you, you were somewhat positioned around how bad cement is. I mean, I think it's not, cement, it's not great for the environment. <laughs> yeah, it does, do, does emit a lot of CO2, but a lot of benefit does come from the usage of cement. So I think the beauty here is recognizing if you can substitute a lot of that cement with this product, it's very attractive. But cement as a product for society is a, is a pretty useful product, is the key. Right. Cement, is a, cement itself is a very yeah. useful product. So yeah. if you can substitute right. gathering the base product, the base materials from yeah. natural right. limestone uh, quarries and actually have it come from plants... Where, right. you're, where you're creating it in, uh, su such as your moss landing location, yeah. um, where you're actually creating it. Um, where does the, the calcium come from to be able to right. create a product that mimics? That's, that's a great question and one of the big challenges. And, and, and the, again, the, the concept originally was naturally occurring brines, um, which are either uh, uh, alkaline um, uh, reservoirs below the ground, or, um, or alkaline deposits, like there are trona deposits in Wyoming and also Sills Valley in California. So they're around, but they're just not hundreds of them. Uh, on the calcium side, uh, the, we're luckier because there's a lot of brines below the ground in aquifers that you can access. And so we're looking around for those, uh, those brines. So the idea would be um, for you to be able to access those calcium ions or divalent iron species from, from aquifers, and, and there is some thought that you may be able to access them from the ocean. Yeah. Now back to the idea of the actual, um, the actual carbon sequestration. Um, I mean, part of it, the carbon is being sequestered in the production of this cement product. Um, are, th are there other methodologies that you're using to sequester? carbon dioxide yeah, well, at this point? We're looking at a range of different products which are bicarbonate based and different material based as well. So there's a, there's a, whole, there's a whole range of work going on uh, looking at that. Um, and uh, you know using the sulfur cycle rather than the carbonate cycle and mm -hmm. also uh, um, looking at uh, um, magnesium based uh, products as well. So there's, there's quite a lot of work going on in that which is why I, I, I tried to broaden it rather than just being cement. Right. It's cement being one of the products but, but obviously cement is a pretty important part of the deal here um, and we're working hard to make that work. Now how does the, the Calera technology integrate itself into um, existing coal power plants? Well, the, we're in the early stages of working out the best way of deploying the technology, but um, the first instance, the thoughts were that we'll have a separate Calera plant and over the fence comes the exhaust gas and we'll run our plant 
and then we'll make cement and we'll sequester CO2. Mm. My own sense is that that will be very expensive and difficult to do. I actually think integrating the Calera absorber into the coal plant and process where there is quite a lot of um, uh, low, uh, low grade waste heat that we could use in our process would be a lot more efficient. Mm. And so we are spending quite a bit of time looking at those integrations now. So great question, on point, and we're looking at coal plants, but not only coal plants, we're looking at uh, cement plants and whether we could integrate into a cement plant and use their waste CO2 back into their cycle and reduce their CO2 footprint. Um, so I, I don't see cement as bad or good. I see it as an opportunity to sequester CO2. And, mm -hmm. and I think the, the long-winded answer is I think integration of these facilities into existing plants will be the way to go. And then in the future, hopefully, if it becomes a well-accepted solution, they would become part of the natural equipment that is in design being put into these new power plants. And, and, and indeed, if I could just extend that idea, yeah. we're looking at doing just that in China right now with Peabody and Huanang. We just signed a memorandum of understanding looking at integrating our facilities in a new build coal-fired uh, power station complex. How is acceptance going in terms of, I mean, you have your pilot plant, the Moss Landing location, yep. that's, um, what is it, uh, 30,000 tons of carbon a year? What did I have? Yeah, it's, it's relatively right? small. Um, right. And it's run off a slipstream of the gas power station right across the road. And that was the concept of taking the, uh, taking the, uh, the exhaust gases and working on it and creating our cement. And you guys will, 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 will have a great time and walk around that. And I think you'll, you'll be pretty impressed and go, wow, look at that. There's, there's, there's white cement dust. And, and there, yeah. there, look, there's, there's actual things they've made out of it. Yeah. So, so from that perspective, I, I, it's, it's clear we can make reactive cement. So that's not an issue. The issue is on scalability and how much does it cost. And obviously, the cost comes down to what energy you're putting in and therefore comes back to the integration story that I think is key to getting it accepted. So what we, and, and I've been in the company now around, uh, oh, since the middle of October, probably five months, four or five months. Mm -hmm. And so my background is all about working out how do, we, how do we take this technology and integrate it and get it to be developed in an economic sense. So that's really the key focus that I've got. And so we're talking to cement companies right now. We're talking to power companies. We've just signed a memorandum of understanding. So there's a big, um, drive a high level of interest in these major companies, but there isn't yet the incentive in North America because carbon isn't priced. Right. So, so, so I'm happy to say there's a lot of interest, and in about, I think, another six months, we'll know whether that interest translates into whether they're prepared to invest in, in, in the systems that I think they need to install. And I'm pretty optimistic we should be able to do that. And then the next step is really how much integration can you get on the heat side, and how much then does it really cost to, to make the product? And so, so, so the, the answer is it's work in progress. Uh, but so far, yeah. pretty good, I think. It sounds, really, it sounds really great. Is there a, uh, I mean, for the companies involved, there's a cost to the cost to the implementation. Um, is there a, a real downside? I mean, the, what, you're, what you're proposing doing is helping pretty dirty technologies clean up their act. Um, right. I'm always going to try and correct you when you position things. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're talking to each other over a, a, over a computer and an and a, and a, and a, and a electrical system that's being, being allowed to work because of be those technologies. Exactly. You're going yeah, to go to a hospital shortly that's powered by those and you're going to be very grateful it's there. <laughs> and there's <laughs> lots of cement in that hospital. Yes. So I think I would rather position it that you know, we should be pushing on an open door. And the way I think these guys should look at this is um, uh, they should be in prepared to invest in a technology that clearly so has the potential to solve a CO2 problem at scale. And the key will be, can we get it to work at scale? And we can't tell that until we get into their plants and do it in a bigger scale. Right. So I think the first step is to get on that ladder and get in and start working with them and I think that's the way to do this, rather than beat them over the head saying you've got to do this and it doesn't work. 
So, you know, I'm pretty optimistic over the next six months to a year, we'll make a lot of progress doing that. And it'll be like climbing up a ladder. We'll get to a stage where we increase the size. We learn lots on integration. We find out what the real costs of this are. We find out the way in which we can access the calcium ions and the best way to get the base, et cetera. So, so it's really, a, and the company is very young, okay? It's three years old. You know, Brent did a great job getting money into the idea, attracting great scientists. You know, the, the, you know, we've got really good patient investors and we've got really good scientists. So I, what I'm now trying to do is just build those relationships with larger industry to get more acceptance, to get on that route of seeing if it can work. And you, you, you have a pretty good faith that it's going to work in terms of where, where you see Calera going in the future. Like, where, okay. where do you hope this company will go? This young, this young company, where do you see it growing up? Well, I think that um, if we're able to uh, sequester CO2 in a scalable economic fashion, in a business environment that wants a CO2 solution, it's, it's, it's obviously a pretty big opportunity. That's why I'm here. You know, I, I moved my family down here, which was quite an effort. You know, two kids in high school, two kids in middle school, and we just bought a property. And, uh, and, and this is an entirely different business for me. But I think it's one that's got huge promise, is, is, is really what I'm saying. Um, I'm not going to, you know, say in three years' time we have to be this big and public. You know, I, I don't think that's the right way to do it. I think the way to look at it is we have to get into cement plants, we have to get into power plants, we have to increase the scale, we have to understand what the real costs are, and we have to work with those players. And if we do that successfully, I think the company's got a great chance of being successful. Great. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to add about Calera before we end this interview? No, I, as I said, you know, I, I have to just say, you know, I think Brent did a great job, Brent Constance, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a privilege to follow on from, uh, from his great ideas and hopefully uh, translate those into some solutions in, uh, in large industries. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Keith. We're partnering with uh, four of the, the biggest uh, venture capital firms in the clean energy space, three in the US, one in Europe. Uh, you know, again, we think that the combination of GE investment and venture capital investment is going to allow us to increase innovation. It's going to allow us to accelerate new ideas. It puts us shoulder to shoulder with some of the smartest tech investors. And we can use the, what I would call the industrial clout of GE to bring technologies to this marketplace faster. GE announced its challenge at a San Francisco event along with its four venture capital partners. Emerald Technology Ventures, Foundation Capital, Kleiner Perkins Caulfield and Byers, and Rockport Capital Partners have all joined with GE. Ideas from companies and individuals can be entered through the ecoimagination.com website for the next 10 weeks. So check out ecoimagination.com. Okay, my name is Martin Deveni, and I'm the uh, Vice President of uh, Materials Development and Process Integration at Clara. And what, what I want to show you today is the, uh, what we do at LabScale to actually develop the process uh, for, the, uh, for the capture and the use of CO2 in, uh, in materials for the uh, built environment. In this particular lab, this is our uh, process chemistry and particle engineering uh, laboratory, where we actually develop the chemistry that we will ultimately use in our large scale for the precipitation of product that contains embodied carbon dioxide. This, uh, the, the, these, the group of scientists that you actually see in the background are actually developing the chemistry that will allow us to actually make a product, an engineered product, that will actually have value uh, and uh, it will have a use in a, a cement or concrete. Um, the material has embodied CO2. Uh, we engineer the particles uh, to actually maximize their beneficial uh, use. And if we uh, walk over here, we can actually see a, a process now being run. And Ryan, you ready to get run? where we're actually doing uh, what we call a precipitation. And this is actually the basis of our process. Uh, we talk about the mineralization by aqueous precipitation. This is the mechanism by which we lock in the CO2 that we have actually captured from flue gas into a solid product. And you can see that Ryan is now uh, adding the uh, particular reagents together. 
This contains our uh, calcium source, it contains our uh, alkaline source, which is the basis of the MAP process. And you can now see that the, the cloudy uh, solution that is now formed actually contains solid particles that contain carbon dioxide now locked into a solid product. This product will be then recovered, dried, and then actually we will characterize it and then use it and test it for uh, the, the applications that we're actually interested in. Okay, we're now in our uh, mortar and concrete testing laboratory. Uh, the material that we actually made using our MAP process in the previous laboratory and our process chemistry and particle engineering laboratory has now been recovered, and this is what it looks like. It's a white, free-flowing powder. Uh, it's calcium carbonate and it contains up to 44 by weight percent of carbon dioxide that is now locked into a solid form. Uh, what we now do is actually we test this material uh, for use in applications uh, that will use cement and concrete. Uh, what you can actually see here is the Clara calcium carbonate compared with a normal uh, ordinary Portland cement. And uh, this is actually another material called fly ash which is also used commonly in the manufacture uh, of concrete. What we're doing now in this laboratory is we're actually we're testing how this material performs and in this particular and the applications that we're focusing on right now, we're testing how this material performs in concrete mixes that do involve ordinary Portland cement whereby we replace a certain percentage of normal cement which has a very high CO2 footprint with ore material that contains embodied with the clara calcium carbonate that contains embodied carbon dioxide. We need to test these materials uh, according to uh, strict uh, industry standards and we follow a lot of ASTM uh, testing protocols and you can now see that this is a mortar cube that now contains uh, a percentage, in this case maybe up to 20% of the Calera calcium carbonate which contains embodied CO2. In this laboratory we then test these materials for example uh, for their compressive strength which is one of the characteristics we're interested in. And this particular apparatus, what we're actually doing is we're testing the compressive strength of that particular cube that we formed using our material. And uh, what we want to show is that that material actually conforms to the industry specification. In this, in this particular case, it's uh, related to the compressive strength. So all of our materials are tested against uh, rigorous industry standards. Uh, all of the materials that we make both at lab scale as well as at our pilot production scale are actually being tested and in this case actually stored for uh, longer term testing. This is our uh, concrete lab where we now take the uh, products that we've actually made and actually start to use them in real world applications where we're actually uh, making concrete and again testing the concrete samples against uh, you know, rigorous uh, industry standards. And you can see some of the uh, specimens that we actually work with. Uh, these are at various stages uh, of testing. So this is our uh, analytical lab where we actually have people who are dedicated to actually fully characterizing and understanding how our materials 
actually interact uh, with the cement. We have a variety of uh, different uh, techniques that allow us to probe both uh, the interaction of our material and cement, both at the macroscopic as well as at the microscopic scale, including uh, X-ray diffraction, which allows us to, confor to confirm the nature of the material that we're actually making. And again, a variety of other analytical techniques, such as uh, Fourier transfer, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, which again will allow us to understand the nature of the material and how it interacts uh, with Portland cement. And what we have here is actually a scanning electron microscope, which actually allows us to see these uh, microscopic particles and how they're actually performing and interacting in the matrix that we're actually uh, embedding the material in. Uh, so we're looking at a calcium carbonate precipitated from our pilot facility down in Moss Landing. And these are one and a half micron round spheres of calcium carbonate. So the sample's down in the, in the bottom here in this, this main chamber. Up here is actually the gun. So the source of electrons is up here. They travel down and they're measured by a detector, which is one of the ports in the back. And the gun in front of you right there, the, uh, the gray box, is a uh, elemental analysis. So based off the energy given off of the particles, we can tell what elements are distributed throughout the uh, material. Want a sneak peek at this technology? We're going to be taking a tour of the Moss Landing facility in just a few moments. So here you are at Moss Landing where we are uh, capturing CO2 from a power plant. What you're looking at there is a 36 inch line that is connected to a gas turbine, which is a power plant that's uh, firing up for, the Southern, for Northern California. That 36 inch line brings uh, flue gas, or the gas that would have gone out the stack, and brings it over to the Calera plant where we're actually converting and mineralizing that CO2 to make building materials such as cement and other, other kind of components. Uh, this, this particular location, you can see, uh, brings that pipe in and we have a, a, a in, induced draft fan. So that's just a fan that's sucking the gas out of the, that would have been going out the stack. In, and blowing it into our absorber unit that you'll see here in a few minutes. Okay, go. So that 36 inch line that we brought in from the, uh, uh, from the power plant comes over to this side of the building. Like I said, it's about a half mile uh, track for that gas to come over here. And then back behind me is the actual absorber unit where we're actually bringing, the, uh, bringing that line in. You can see it come in at the, uh, here and go into the bottom of this. And this is a very large absorption unit where you actually contact the CO2 from the flue gas, that is from the gases that would have gone out this stack, with a spray of, our, of alkaline material. And that actually absorbs the CO2, the global climate uh, pollutant that would have gone out that stack, has now been absorbed in this large absorption unit. This is a large spray tower system. Uh, this is our first generation. We've actually on about our third generation technology associated with that. Then the, what's formed there is actually a, what looks like milk. It actually is a, a white liquid slurry. That, and for all intended purposes, it looks very much like milk. And then the rest of the process is about dewatering that and making our product. So as you, as this, out of this absorption unit, what you'll find is we then go to a dewatering unit. We have to take this slurry that we've made by absorbing the CO2, and then we have to, and the, we have to dewater it. And this is a large dewatering system that uh, we're utilizing to actually evaluate this particular technology for being able to do that mechanical dewatering. 
So we had mo both mechanical dewatering and then the final drying. This is the mechanical component of it. That is, it doesn't use heat. It just uses centrifugal forces or gravitational forces to do the separation of, the, of our fine particles from the water. So this is our pilot scale unit. Uh, one of the key elements of our process is to be able to uh, evaluate and test the various components and every, the, the various subsystems. So to be able to do that, in California there's not a lot of coal, so we actually had to build a small coal boiler that would allow us to have the, uh, the gas composition that exactly matches the, what would be in a power plant. So this is what we call our boiler simulator facility. It was a facility we designed specially and had built for us by General Electric where we downfire coal and we can actually burn a small amount of coal under the same time temperature and combustion history that would actually exist in a full-scale pulverized coal boiler. And because of that, we get exactly the same composition. And that's the critical component. We want to be able to have the same composition so that when we do our work on the flue gas, on the, on the exhaust gas, it will be identical to the gas that would be in a, in a large-scale unit. So this, this particular unit gives us that time, temperature, combustion history control to be able to, 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 be able to generate those gases. Then we actually... We are, we're also monitoring the gases. We have continuous emission monitors that I'll show you in a few minutes that actually monitor the gas. So not only know are we running in exactly the same conditions, but we also know that it's actually generating the same composition because we're always directly measuring it. So that gas is, as you can see, goes through the wall. That little that pipe there is where it goes through the wall. So that has the same composition of gases that would come out of any large power plant. It's just small scale, so we can do small scale test work. We go uh, that that uh, comes through the wall. We'll go on the other side and we'll trace it from the other side. So you can see that you can see the pipe comes through the wall and then connects to this bag house. So this is just a, a simple filter. See the gases come right through the wall there. Just that this is on the other side of the wall that we were just looking at. Comes through that, and we can either go through a bag house, which is a filter system. That's common would be in a pulverized coal-fired power plant, or we can even bypass that. Uh, in some of our recent tests, we don't run with any pre-scrubbing whatsoever. Uh, generally, though, we do use a fabric filter. But then that that pipe comes across, and you can see the the white box up there. That's the, uh, that's, and the, what looks like an a, a cord coming out of it, that's a continuous emission monitoring system. That's where we actually make measurements continuously of things like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, sulfur, all the pollutants that would normally be in the gas. That then goes from there into this absorption unit. So this, this is the heart. This is the, where you saw that very large uh, absorber unit. This is a small version of that where we're actually doing the same thing. We're actually absorbing and, and contacting the, the, the flue gas, the exhaust gas, with a, a water-based aqueous media uh, that's a, that, has a, that has the right conditions for, for uh, uh, capturing the CO2. Not only capturing the CO2, but capturing all the pollutants. Uh, many of the pollutants, all of the weak acids like sulfur dioxides and uh, even, even things like mercury are captured as part of the absorption unit. So that's the, that's the, so that, that's the absorption step. So, so once the gases are absorbed into the liquid, then we actually mix it with a hard brine, something like that contains calcium. And there we make this calcium, what we're making here is calcium, is making calcium carbonate. That calcium carbonate, um, that probably be as far as we can get. That calcium carbonate is, uh, is very well particle engineered. So one of the critical components of our technology is to not only generate inert calcium carbonate, but generate what we call metastable calcium carbonate that, can, that, that has cementitious value. That is, if you put it in cement, it will participate in the reactions and harden just like the cement does. So it's a really uh, critical component of it is this precipitation process where we, where we make what look, would it be the same thing as you make when you, in your shower. If you have a shower and you sometimes see the buildup of material on the shower head, well, that's calcium carbonate. That's, from, that's where you've removed calcium from the hard water and it's making calcium carbonate. We're just doing that at a very large scale under very c 
controlled conditions so that we have valuable material that can be used in, in building materials and other applications. So once we've actually made the precipitate, we actually have this process where we've made that uh, white precipitate material, we then start dewatering it. So uh, the, the, what we, we have is this slurry. Again, it looks like milk. It's a very white, milky material. And the big, now, now we start removing the water. And we start with a couple of mechanical different techniques of doing that. One is called a lamella, which is just a, a way of separating the water with a natural uh, uh, laminar uh, uh, flow system. And then we move to a, a filter press. So this is you know, what you think about as a classic uh, filter press where you would be actually pressing the liquid through the material. And you can see the uh, actual filter presses up in, in, into that region. And that allows us to get the, uh, the material dewatered. And this is, the, this is the kind of material that we would produce from that. A very, very, uh, a very uh, uh, pretty almost dry material that's actually 100% calcium carbonate. So this would have been CO2. This contains C C carbon dioxide that would have been going out the stack is now being put into these solid materials. So now we've not only sequestered it, but we've now got it in a form that we can start to use and has value. It's, it's valuable as cement itself. Put that back there. So that's 100% that's uh, calcium carbonate uh, generated under these very reactive conditions that, uh, that uh, give us that cementitious value. So one of the things you have to do, you have to, these are, you notice vinegar and some of the other components. One of the things you have to do is to keep the pipes clean, just like you have to keep your pipes clean in, when you're sho in your shower, you have to routinely clean out the calcium carbonate. So we do a, a vinegar flush uh, after uh, every run to keep the pipes flowing good because of this very reactive metastable material, it tends to want to cement in location. So if you don't keep it clean and, and uh, always moving, you in fact, uh, you won't be able to uh, get it to complete the process. So all of this equipment is different drying technologies that we're testing right now. So this is a spray dryer. So uh, if, you, if you don't take it to, all, to the very dry conditions and you still have a slurry type of, of condition, you can actually spray, the spray that liquid into a high temperature hot gas and that will do the final drying of it so that you'll end up with a dry prep powder. If you, take it, if you heavily dewater it, like the sample that I just showed you, you, in, you can actually take it to a different type of drying system, a new drying system that we're trying out, a, what we call a, which is a swirl, uh, stable, uh, swirl uh, fluidizer system. And this is the, flu, the swirl fluidizer system, system will allow us to actually do the final drying step. So even though the material I showed you a few minutes ago looked very dry, it still had about 30% moisture in it. So you want to be able to do at a final drying step is to be able to utilize this kind of technology, which is basically a swirler. You basically you dump the material in, it heats it up to a, a moderate temperature of about uh, 200 degrees Celsius, and that does the final drying step. And then the material is captured. That insulated uh, device in the back is where the final material is actually captured. You, it's captured in a in a, a fabric filter where you get the final small particles. And then, we can show you in a few minutes, I'll show you exactly what that product looks like. So that's the final product. So that's the final calcium carbonate material that we've generated that would have gone out the stack. Now it's, this, this is carbon dioxide that's, that's actually uh, being uh, uh, sequestered in this final form. And that material can be used in cement and in cement conditions. We have a, a very extensive laboratory where we, actually, we mix these materials with ordinary Portland cement and, and, can, and test their, their performance relative to other building materials. And we're currently meeting all of the ASTM 1157 standards for using supplemental cementitious material using these, mater these, these kinds of materials that we've captured. The beauty of that, of course, is that you now, instead of having that CO2 that would have gone out in the stack, had a major impact on the global climate, now we're putting into something extremely stable that can then it can be used and have a value beyond the, the, uh, just the, the fact that you're sequestering CO2, but in fact you are uh, putting material that you have ability to sell and go into the marketplace. It can be 
really important in places like China and India who are you're doing a lot of power plants, but they're also using a lot of cement. This sort of attacks both of those processes together. So that's our final product. That's the material that we would then uh, end up with uh, and, and have the uh, ability to, uh, to sequester CO2. So this is, this is a different form of material. This is where we've actually turned it into an aggregate. So you think about rocks, where I was showing you before, the, uh, the white powder is a material that is, uh, has, is metastable. It's, a re, it's, it's partially reactive. So when you put it into cement, it recrystallizes into to inert material. This material uh, is actually already turned into an, an inert material and can be used as a replacement for the rocks. If you think about concrete, concrete consists of cement, which is the glue that holds it together, sand, and then, and then rocks, aggregate, that gives it bulk and strength. And this is a material that can actually, uh, actually replace the, the rock fraction of concrete. So this is our electrochemical pilot plant. So this facility is, makes one of the critical ingredients in our process, which is the alkalinity. We need alkalinity to be able to capture CO2. Alkalinity you can think of as a base and an acid. CO2, carbon dioxide, is a weak acid. So this is generating the base and allows us to do the absorption reaction. And what we've done is we've pioneered a new technology based upon electrochemistry that would allow us to generate that base uh, at very low energy requirements. Uh, we call it ABLE for short, alkalinity based on low energy. But it's a, a, a Calera Pioneer technology specifically for generating this material. So what you're seeing here is the cells, the electrochemical cells that we use to generate that alkalinity. The blue devices are a series of different what we call cells, which are similar to batteries except very large scale batteries that generate this alkalinity. Uh, you can see what we start with right here is salt. So that's, that's a simple, you're just taking salt and water and splitting it using electricity to make sodium, chlor sodium hydroxide and a acid such as hydrochloric acid. And so the process you're seeing here in, in below is all just the, the, uh, the processing of the salt. We take the water, clean up the water, make sure that it's very clean before it goes into the cell. But this is really the key, one of the key enabling technologies that allows us to do this process economically by it being able to generate alkalinity at, at, with low energy. This is, beyond, this is much better than the current state of the art, which would be chloralkali. It uses technology that we pioneered here at, at Calera, and it makes it really makes it so it's generally applicable. Any place we can find salty water and electricity, you can actually do this process. So it's, a, it's an important. We're making improvements in this technology every day. We've got some new advances coming in this that uh, we'll be announcing here in the future, which will make this even uh, more attractive technology. That's it for this episode of Green Tech Today. Subscribe at twit.tv forward slash GTT and never miss a show. If you have a question or a comment, email us at greentechtoday at twit.tv. Or you can leave a voicemail at 415-GT-TODAY.